what's going to be left, like you, like you said, your children, your grandchildren. They'll miss so much that we have. It affects our whole culture because we're land people. And when we're not able to harvest our, our foods, then it also affects our food security, our food sovereignty. I really just hate to see anything destroyed. And that is what I believe is happening with this spraying. It's destroying this. Bob Barons and Joe Jones are trappers who both have trap lines in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. Barons is from Sault Ste. Marie and Jones is from Garden River First Nation and they've both been trapping for more than 30 years. This is a good box, it's yeah. a good set. Nothing today, that's okay. Both Barons and Jones are concerned about the practice of aerial spraying glyphosate-based herbicide in the woods out here. In forestry, it's become common to use glyphosate-based herbicide to kill off plants that will compete with newly planted seedlings in areas that have been clear-cut. Glyphosate-based herbicide was developed by Monsanto, and many people have heard of their weed killer marketed under the brand name Roundup. Vision is a Monsanto brand of glyphosate herbicide that is used in forestry. I was notified by the Ministry of Natural Resources via a letter in uh, 1988 when they were going to spray Vision down on my trap line down the uh, what is known as the Mile 11 Road. We had an abundance of rabbits, songbirds, porcupines, beaver, they all started to decline. A lot of the trappers are having problems with the decline in beaver, me included. I'm not seeing the animals that I did see, porcupines I mentioned. I'm not seeing what we call the whiskey jack. I believe he's a Canada Jay, the gray jay. We're not seeing those birds, and I'm attributing that to the spring. And Joe Jones is seeing what Barons is seeing too. I haven't seen any skunks. So the animals are, like they were saying, they're disappearing or moving somewhere else. And it's not one thing. It's all of what's out here. So it, just like what you say, I see it affects. If I had to go over there and get some medicine and affected by that aerial spring, clear cutting aerial spring, and everything else affects my life with the medicine and the foods. The government does acknowledge that glyphosate-based herbicide use in forestry causes reductions in animal numbers. Short-term reductions in numbers of some wildlife species, e.g. small mammals or birds, are known to occur as an indirect result of changes to their optimal vegetative habitat. Such changes are typically quite transient, with numbers returning to normal levels within two to three years as vegetation and preferred habitat or food re-establishes on the treated site. This publication also notes that similarly, moose and deer may also avoid glyphosate-treated areas as well for a few years. But Jones and Barons are noticing ongoing declines in the numbers of animals over a 30-year period. And this most recent trapping season, Jones has also noticed a difference in beaver meat he's harvested. The meat in the beaver, though, uh, this fall is it's going black, especially in the bigger beaver. 
You cut them open? Yeah. And uh, well, I check it before, <laughs> and there's meat in there. And sometimes you check it for bait too, but it's not as red. It's it's really, you know, like this color of black. The question of whether the effects Barons and Jones are noticing are related to glyphosate continues to go unanswered, thanks in part to the provincial government's refusal to conduct a review. In 2017, Barons asked the Provincial Environment Ministry to review the use of glyphosate herbicide in managing forests. But the ministry told him a review was not warranted. I got two for this. Yeah. <laughs> A group of indigenous elders Jones is part of has had no luck in their attempts to stop the aerial spraying of glyphosate. The traditional ecological knowledge, or tech, elders group have representatives from each of the 21 bands in the Robinson-Huron Treaty area. And with the help of Sue Chiblo of Garden River First Nation, they have approached both the provincial and federal governments with their concerns about the use of glyphosate in forestry. They're really good at um, playing ping pong. So we went to the Ministry of Natural Resources and they said, well, no, we just issue the license, so that's not our problem, it's Health Canada's problem. So we went to Health Canada and they said, well, we don't actually do the spraying, we're just saying that it's okay and it's up to the companies to use it or not use it. Yeah, Chiblo and the tech elders want the spraying to stop because they see it as an impediment to living their lives in the traditional way. A lot of the elders are talking about we have to go back to our traditional diets, but we're not going to be able to go back to our traditional diets because they keep on poisoning the forest. We're here first. This is our land. We signed treaties um, to, keep, to maintain the peace with the idea of sharing. Their idea of sharing, I guess we should have hashed that out a bit more because their idea of sharing is not the uh, same idea as ours. We are given the guarantee that we are going to be able to live our lives the way we had in the past, which includes hunting, fishing, trapping, and doing those types of activities. Our small men have big dreams, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tech co-founder Ray Al puts it even more simply. Nishnabe does not believe in any chemical use in their territory. If it can kill one item, one blade of grass, it's no good. If it can kill one thing, we don't want it. Everything's got to live in harmony. And for tech elder Skip Jones, it's an emotional issue too. I feel really, really bad about this. I feel really hurt because I am Anishinaabe. Uh, I love the land and love everything about it. And I love the future for our children, not only our children, but the children of the, of the non-natives. They're getting nowhere with Canadian government officials. So Chiblo and the tech elders have decided to approach the World Health Organization for help. The WHO's International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, has found that glyphosate is probably carcinogenic to humans. Given IARC's stance on glyphosate, Chiblo is hopeful that the WHO might help pressure Canadian officials to take the tech elders' concerns more seriously. Well, the, they have um, a lot of power, right? They dictate to other governments um, about health and what's, what's good and what's bad. So the World Health Organization will, should be able to assist based on the fact that nobody in Europe is using this anymore and pressure Health Canada and Ontario into stop allowing this to be used inside their forestry operations on our lands. We've already sent a letter to the uh, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to invite him to our area to shoot so that we can share our concerns on what's happening um, because it is a violation of our rights and um, we're waiting to hear back from him but also too with the World Health Organization initially a letter will be sent to them. Chiblo also points out that stopping the spraying of glyphosate is a step that might be in line with a campaign promise made by Ontario's Premier. Well, you know, it could be, it could be an opportunity because Doug Ford is all about creating jobs, right? Mm. So if we look at stop, the, the, um, stop using herbicide, we will create manual tending jobs. Mm. Okay. So it could be an opportunity. But as Chiblo and the tech elders take their fight to the WHO, 
there is another fight happening in U.S. courts, which may have an impact too. Coming up, we head to San Francisco to hear about lawsuits filed by more than 11,000 Americans who say glyphosate herbicide made them sick. There is a wealth of scientific evidence uh, tying non-Hodgkin lymphoma and cancers and health problems overall to glyphosate herbicides. Um, and these studies have been done by many different scientists in many different parts of the world over many, many years. San Francisco has become a hotspot for legal challenges against Monsanto, the division of Bayer which produces much of the world's glyphosate-based herbicide. The Bay Area is home to Lee Johnson, who in 2018 was awarded $289 million by a jury which found Monsanto had failed to warn of the carcinogenic dangers of Roundup. The judge later slashed Johnson's amount to $78 million, and Johnson has yet to see a penny of it as Monsanto's lawyers are appealing. But the fact that Johnson's lawyers were able to convince a jury that his non-Hodgkin lymphoma was caused by his exposure to glyphosate herbicide has emboldened a wave of litigants. More than 11,000 people have filed similar lawsuits against Monsanto in the United States. And the jury trial for one of those is underway in San Francisco. But the science around glyphosate's allegedly toxic effects on humans is contradictory, in the sense that much of the research suggests glyphosate ought to be completely safe. Bayer, the new parent company of Monsanto, would not do an interview with APTN Investigates while the latest trial is underway. But they did provide a statement pointing to what they call more than 800 rigorous studies submitted to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and other regulators around the world, which they say confirm glyphosate herbicide is safe when used as directed. Bayer also points to the, quote, largest and most recent epidemiologic study, which followed more than 50,000 pesticide applicators for more than 20 years and found no association between glyphosate-based herbicides and cancer. But in court, Johnson's lawyers argued that Monsanto had paid experts to ghostwrite studies that countered critical reports about their product. Evidence was put forward in arguments against a Monsanto motion to retry the Johnson case, claiming an internal PowerPoint document revealed an academic expert hired to produce studies in support of the company's claims was considered an invaluable asset by the company. Carrie Gillum has been writing about Monsanto and glyphosate since the late 90s, when she began covering the agriculture beat for Reuters. She's in San Francisco for the new trial. When Gillum looks at the court file, she takes issue with the way Bayer frames the issue of the safety of glyphosate. There is a wealth of scientific evidence uh, tying non-Hodgkin lymphoma and cancers and health problems overall to glyphosate herbicides. Um, and these studies have been done by many different scientists in many different parts of the world over many, many years. And uh, you know, that is what the published uh, literature, scientific literature, shows us. And that's what the International Agency for Research on Cancer looked at uh, to come to the conclusion that that it was a probable human carcinogen uh, with an association to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Gillum now works for U.S. Right to Know, which is a non-profit company advocating for transparency and accountability in food production. The trial Gillum has come to observe involves a California man named Edwin Hardiman, who used Roundup regularly for three decades on his property. And Hardiman's complaint in the court action states he believes his exposure to Roundup caused his non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This case is really important. Uh, this case is also really different because the judge has bifurcated the trial. 
uh, meaning he's dividing the evidence into two phases. So it's only science. Uh, and the, the jurors have to look at the science, and they have to listen to both sides argue about what is the true science, and then they have to render a decision. Uh, did it cause Mr. Hardiman's cancer or did it not? That means the claims made by lawyers during the Johnson trial that Monsanto used ghost-written studies were not heard by the jury in the first part of the Hardiman trial. But in its verdict deciding the first part of the trial on March 19th, the jury did agree that Edwin Hardiman's lawyers proved by a preponderance of evidence that his exposure to Roundup was a substantial factor in causing his non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And now in the second half of the Hardiman trial, the jury will have to determine liability and damages. It's a derby. Everybody goes to derby. The splitting of the trial into two parts is an unusual step that had been met with resistance from Hardiman's attorneys. Jennifer Moore is one of the two main attorneys representing Hardiman in court. Well, I've been doing this over 20 years, and I've never encountered that personally. There's no question we have to try the case with our hands tied behind our back. But at the same time, the science is very strong that there is an association between Roundup and cancer. The jury in the Johnson case ruled that there was clear and convincing evidence that Monsanto acted with malice or oppression in attempting to conceal their product's potential danger. That jury's decision is now under appeal in federal court after state court judge Suzanne R. Bolanos denied Monsanto's motion for a new trial. The jury in the Johnson trial had to check 15 boxes beside questions posed by the court in order to reach their verdict. For each of the 15 questions, jurors found against the company. The idea that Roundup ought to be safe for humans exposed to it is based on the fact that glyphosate works by targeting an enzyme behind plant growth. That enzyme doesn't exist in humans, so the thinking is it shouldn't hurt us. But some reports indicate an increased relative risk of developing non-Hodgkin lymphoma for people who have particularly high exposure to glyphosate. People such as Lee Johnson, who was drenched in it. Carrie Gillum is writing a new book focused on Lee Johnson and his court win against Monsanto. So Lee uh, was a groundskeeper um, at the Benicia School District uh, in Northern California. Big part of his job was to spray Roundup and Ranger Pro, another Monsanto brand. Uh, and one day, as he describes it, he was out and he was wearing a full protective suit. And he was out using a, a truck-mounted sprayer, in essence, and uh, taking a hose and, and uh, spraying weeds on this uh, property between an elementary school and a high school and uh, the hose snagged on something and popped off uh, the, the tank sprayer, or the tank in the back of the truck, and started spewing this uh, glyphosate herbicide you know, into the air like a fountain of this pesticide. And he had to stop it, so he you know, dove into the back of the truck, essentially, to try to stem the flow and just became drenched in the pesticide uh, from head to toe. And it was not long after that that he started developing these lesions on his body. So a jury in California accepted that Lee Johnson's cancer was caused by his exposure to glyphosate. But what does that mean in relation to the aerial spraying of Canadian forests? How exactly glyphosate might be causing cancer is not known. But there are studies indicating that glyphosate may disrupt the endocrine systems of humans and animals. The endocrine system is essentially a collection of glands in our bodies that produce hormones which regulate metabolism, growth and development, tissue function, sexual function, reproduction, sleep and mood. So an animal in the woods might plausibly experience a variety of issues as a result of eating plants sprayed with glyphosate herbicide. And so if regulators in Canada and around the world have incorrectly concluded that glyphosate-based herbicide is safe, where should concerned people turn? 9,500 square miles. As mentioned earlier, the traditional ecological knowledge, or tech, elders of the Robinson-Huron Treaty area 
are turning to the World Health Organization for help. Johnson's lawyers argued during trial that Monsanto put enormous efforts into attacking experts who concluded their product was unsafe. They also argued that the company misled regulators. For those reasons, attorney Jennifer Moore thinks contacting the WHO is a smart move. Going to the World Health Organization is absolutely the right thing they should do. They need to get away from any type of body that is subject to political pressure. Because what we have seen is that Monsanto has incredible lobbying efforts. And so you want to get away from political bodies and you want to go to some, you know, an organization like the World Health Organization that has got the interest of the public at its heart. Meanwhile, back in Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, trapper Bob Barons wonders if Doug Ford's newly elected government might want to step up and do something on this issue. In all fairness to our new government, we haven't talked to them. I know I haven't. And it might be worth me picking up a phone and, uh, and talking to them about it. Because I, I think that uh, maybe their heart is in the right place and, and will will stop this for us. I'd like to give them a good chance. We contacted the office of Doug Ford's Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, John Yakubuski, but Minister Yakubuski's office declined our interview request. And so it seems for the time being, perhaps nothing will change in a situation that troubles Trapper and tech elder Joe Jones. It affects me deeply. In my heart, how long will this last? Will that aerial spring continue and continue? What's going to be left, like, he, like we said, your children, your grandchildren? What are you going to look at? Are you going to have animals too? Or even like right now, there's no birds. It's, they'll miss so much that we have. 